never saw a man meet death with finer courage. Don't let us stay in there too long. won't you, and not let it run away with you or anything. I suppose I'm about the safest bicycle rider in the whole of Brooklyn. Ah, 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 do you mind that now? Ah? No? Can I ride it now, dears? Can I go now? Oh. I can't wait one minute. Mr. Pops has to see it, and Dick. Can I go now, dearest? At once? Yes, dear, only do be careful. Oh, dear. Oh, there we are. Oh, you know. Good morning. How are your bones today, Mrs. McGilligaddy? Oh, none too good after the rainstorm yesterday. Oh, they ate last night something cruel. Ties me up in knots, the rain does. Does it? How very peculiar. But, uh, it's a fine day to go bicycle riding. Oh, I suppose so. For them that has bicycles and can ride them. I suppose everybody who has a new bicycle will take it out and ride it today. Glory be to goodness, and whose bicycle might that be? It's mine. It's my birthday present from the earth. Oh, it's a daisy show. Fine enough for the president to ride. And it has all the latest improvements. Oh, sure it sounds like the bells of St. Patrick. Sure it's the luckiest boy in the world, John. Well, I'll have to be going. Oh, I nearly forgot. Please choose my apple now, Mrs. McGillicuddy. But would you mind keeping it for me until I get back? Sure. I 
I'd like to get back to you. Give us a little ride, will you, bub? I'm sorry, no. Oh, uh, scared I'll get it dirty? No, but I'd rather ride it myself. Oh, 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 oh I do. Do. Hey, English, when'd you get back from dear old London? I'm not English. I'm an American. Now, where'd you get that kind of gab? My father was English. If it's any of your affairs. Oh, does your mother know you're out? Don't you dare talk about my mother. Mama's pet. Mama's pet. Mama's pet. I think you'd better take your hand off that wheel. Want to make anything out of it? I want to make you get out of the way. Oh. <laughs> you don't dance, you sissy cat. Sissy cat. <laughs> see my brother Ben off. He's going out west. Who is he? Where? Texas? No, Chicago. Well, that would be splendid. Riding Mustangs and shooting there. There's my brother Ben now. Come on, Dick. I've got to leave. Well, come on down to Mr. Hop's door as quickly as you can. What do you say to a little birthday party? Ginger pop and cookies and some candy. That would be perfect, Mr. Hobbs. Only... Uh, Only? Well, uh, Dick's coming very soon. And I was thinking uh, if we could wait. I guess there'll be enough to go around. There's a lump coming, I think. Quite a big one. What are you reading, Mr. Hobbs? Ah, uh, that's the way they go on now. British aristocracy. I've got no use for them. Earls and marquises going around as if they was lords of creation, wearing their coronets. Did you ever know any marquises, Mr. Hobbs, or earls? I should say not. I'd just like to catch one of them inside here, that's all. I'll have no grasping tyrant sitting around on my cracker barrels. Perhaps they wouldn't be earls if they knew any better. Oh, wouldn't they, though? They just glory in it. It's in them. They're a bad lot. Here you are, Dick. Just in time for Seti's birthday feast. Gee, Manetti, ginger pop and everything. Here's to your health, Seti. Many happy birthdays. Thank you very much, Mr. Hobbs. Why, Mary. Come on home, darling. The mistress is wanting you. Oh, glory be. Would you look at your face? I'm very sorry, Mr. Hobbs, but I shan't be able to stay for the feast. Is there anything wrong with Dearest? Uh, not at all, so there's nothing the matter with her. What happened, Mary? Now, don't be asking me any questions. But queer, strange things happening to us. If you forgive me, Mrs. Errol, you must not disregard the great position to which your son has fallen heir through the death of his uncle, your late husband's brother. 
But what it amounts to, Mr. Havisham, is that you want to take my boy away from me. Mrs. Ellery, you must remember that I'm acting quite impersonally and simply as a lawyer of the Earl of Dorincourt. The Earl of Dorincourt disowned his son and has refused to recognize his grandson until now. Why should I give up my boy? Oh, I'm afraid I've been very stupid, Mrs. Ellery. I should have told you, my instructions are that you shall accompany Lord Fauntleroy to England. Oh. However, I must remind you that Lord Dorincourt is not very friendly toward you. He's an old man and has always had very strong prejudices against America and Americans. and was bitterly opposed to his son's marriage. He's fixed in his determination not to see you. You live at the lodge and a suitable income will be provided for you. The only stipulation is you make no attempt to visit your son at the castle, nor even enter the park gates. There's your sister, Mary. Hello, Bridget. Why, what's the matter? Mrs. Michael, it's worse than we've no money. We can't pay the rent. I don't know what I'm going to do. Now, Bridget, I've more important things to attend to. <laughs> I wonder what your husband's wishes would have been in this matter. You... you knew my husband? Yes, I knew Captain Arrow well and liked him, as everybody did. He was greatly attached to his old home. Yes, I know. He, above everyone, would have appreciated what this means to your son, the very great advantages he will have. Yes. You're right. My husband would have wished it. Mr. Havisham, I must ask you to let me tell Ceddie about this in my own way and in my own time. He must never know his grandfather dislikes me. If he did, it would make it harder for them to be friends. Very well. Your son will thank you for this when he's a man. I hope his grandfather would love Ceddie. He has a very affectionate nature and has always been loved. Havisham, dear, whom your grandfather has sent to see us, all the way from England. How do you do, sir? So this is little Lord Fauntleroy. You see, dear, your grandfather has no more children now, and he's very lonely. So he wants us to go and live with him in England. Because he's an earl, and you are his heir, you will have a new name, Lord Fauntleroy. And someday you will be the Earl of Dorincourt. Oh, dearest, do I have to be an earl? None of the boys are earls. Can't I not be one? I'm afraid it can't be helped, dear. Just think, dear. Soon we'll be starting for England. Do we have to go to England, dearest? I'd much rather not. Oh, what will Mr. Hobbs say? Anything else, ma'am? Uh, how much is your table butter? Thirteen cents a pound, ma'am. Thirteen? Why, the last I bought was only twelve and a half cents. That must have been last month. It's thirteen today. Oh, indeed. Well, never mind the butter. Heavens and earth, if prices go any higher, we'll all starve to death. Good day. Good day, ma'am. Hello, Sadie. What's the matter? Mr. Hobbs, do you remember what we were talking about yesterday morning? It seems to me we was talking about England. Yes, yes, and earls, don't you remember? Oh, yes. We did touch them up a little. That's all. You said you wouldn't have them sitting around on your cracker barrels. So I did, and I meant it, too. Just let them try it, that's all. Mr. Hobbs, one is sitting on this barrel now. What? Yes, I am one. Or I'm going to be. I won't deceive you, Mr. Hobbs. It's the heat. It is a hot day. 
How do you feel? Got any pain? Thank you, I'm all right. I'm sorry to say it's true, Mr. Hobbs. Mr. Haversham, he's a lawyer, came all the way from England to tell us about it. My grandfather sent him. Who is your grandfather? I couldn't very easily remember it, so I wrote it down. John Arthur Mullinux Errol, Earl of Dorincourt. That's his name, and he lives in a castle. Uh, two or three castles, I think. All his sons have died now. That's why I shall be an earl. Now I'm Lord Fauntleroy. Oh, well, I'll be jiggered. One of us has got a sunstroke. Oh, no, we haven't. We'll have to make the best of it, Mr. Hobbs. What did you say your name was? Cedric Errol, Lord Fauntleroy. Well, I am jiggered. Well, you always did talk more English than American. You think there's no getting out of it? I'm afraid not, Mr. Hobbs. Dear says that Father would wish me to do it. But if I have to be an Earl, I can try to be a good one. I'm not going to be a tyrant, Mr. Hobbs. And if there's ever to be another war with America, I shall try and stop it. England's a long way off, isn't it? It's across the Atlantic Ocean. That's the worst of it. Perhaps I shan't see you for a long time. I don't like to think about that, Mr. Hobbs. Well, the best of friends must part. I'm afraid, Mr. Havisham, our American food must seem very strange to you. A little, ma'am. I find that muffins are biscuits and biscuits are cookies. <laughs> but the cooking's excellent. And after all, it's the company that makes a meal exquisite, not the food. Thank you, Mr. Havisham. When you're an earl, you'll give splendid dinners in one of the most beautiful castles in England. Do you know, I'm not sure I know exactly what an earl is. And I think if anybody's going to be one, he ought to know, don't you? Would you mind explaining it to me? Well, someone is made an earl generally because he's done some service to his sovereign or some great deed. Oh, that's like the president. Oh, is it? Is that why your presidents are elected? Yes, sir. When a man is very good and knows a great deal, he's elected president. And they have talks like processions, and bands, and everybody makes speeches. I used to think perhaps I might like to be president, but I never thought of being an earl. No, being an earl is rather different from being a president. An earl is generally of very ancient lineage. Uh, what's that? Very old family, extremely old. Oh, that's like the apple woman. She's a hundred, I should think. She's of such ancient lineage, it would surprise you how she can stand up. I you feel sorry for anyone who's so poor and has such ancient lineage. She says hers has gone into her bones, and the rain makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> when I said ancient lineage, I didn't mean old age. The first Earl of Dalincourt was created an Earl hundreds of years ago. Well, well, that was a long time ago, wasn't it, dear? Yes, dear. Many Earls have been very brave men, <laughs> and have fought in great battles. I should like to do that myself. My father was a soldier and a very brave man, as brave as George Washington. I'm glad Earl's are brave. That's a great fountain. Would you excuse me a moment, please? There's someone I must see. Well, certainly, of course. There, um, there's another advantage of being an Earl. Some of them have a great deal of money. That's a good thing to have. I wish I had a great deal of money. Do you? Why? Well, there's so many things a person can do with money. If I were very rich, I'd buy the apple woman a little tent to put her stall in, and a stove. And I'd give her a shawl, because then her bones wouldn't feel so badly. Hmm. And uh, what else would you do, if you were rich? I'd buy dearest all sorts of beautiful things. Dearest? I call mother dearest, because father did. And was Dick. And who's Dick? Dick's a bootblack. I'd buy him some new cloths, some brushes, 
and a new sign and start him out fair. He says that's all he wants, is to start out fair. Hmm. Is there anything else? Well, I think Mr. Hobbs would like a gold watch and chain. But what would you get just for yourself if you were rich? Isn't there one particular thing you've dreamed of having? Yes. A pony. But I suppose that would be too much to even dream about. I'm so sorry. A poor woman who was in trouble came to see me. Oh, is it Bridget? Yes, dear. I wish we could do something for her. She has six children and her husband is out of work. He has inflammatory rheumatism and that's the kind of rheumatism that's dreadful. Before I left Court Castle, the Earl said that if you expressed any wishes, I was to gratify them and give you anything you desire. Now, here, here are five pounds. In your money, twenty-five dollars. If you have any desire, to assist this poor woman, I'm sure your grandfather would wish it. Can I have it now? Can I give it to her this minute? May I be excused, please, dearest? Yes, Sadie. Bridget! Bridget, wait a minute! Here's the money. My grandfather gave it to me. It's for you. It's a great deal of money, Mr. Havisham. We've never had very much. I'm just beginning to realize the great power Sadie will have. Such a child still. I'm a little afraid. I think from what I've seen of him, that you have nothing to fear. Oh, I hope not. He mustn't be spoiled by all these wonderful changes. She cried. She said she was crying for joy. I never saw anyone cry for joy before. My grandfather must be a very good man. It's more, more agreeable being an earl than I thought it was going to be. In fact, I'm almost quite glad I'm going to be one. <sighs> Didn't we, dearest? We always will like it. Yes, darling. Yes. I've come to say goodbye. I have to go to England to be a lord, and I shouldn't like to have to have your bones on my mind every time oh, it rains. Oh, bless your dear little heart. With all your kindness to me, my bones is as quiet as anything. Can I give you a kiss for that? Of course. Here's an apple to eat on the board. Thank you very much. Oh, no, darling. Why should you pay? As my late husband used to say, this one's on the house. <laughs> Thank you again. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, darling. good. Gee, if trade gets any better, I'll be rolling around in diamonds and poils. That would be splendid, wouldn't it? I hope you have every sort of luck and happiness. Thanks, same to you, and I hope you think about us sometime when you're way over there, as they say, on foreign soil. 
I'll think about you all the time. And I'll write to you. And you must write to me. Here's where you send your letter. Gee, I, I wish you wasn't going away. Thanks, mister, for all the swell things you've done for him. Certainly deserves it. He's a game little kid. Gee, I almost forgot. Yeah, I bought this for you. It's a handkerchief. You can use it when you get among them swells. Oh, Dick, it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's, it's extraordinary. I'll use it always. Thank you, Dick. Thank you very much. Well, goodbye. Well, goodbye. Would you mind very much not going in with me? I think this time I'd better be alone. Certainly, I quite understand. This is for you, Mr. Hobbs. Eddie. That's just what I wanted for a long time. This is my real present, Mr. Hobbs. There's something written on it. Inside the case, I told the man what to say. You read it. From his oldest friend, Lord Fauntleroy, to Mr. Hobbs. When this you see, remember me. you see. Remember me. I don't want you to forget me. Oh, I won't forget you. Don't you go and forget me when you go to, over there amongst those British aristocracy. I shouldn't forget you, whoever I was among. I hope you'll come to see me. Perhaps my grandfather will write and invite you. You... You wouldn't mind him being an earl, would you? I mean, uh, you wouldn't stay away just because he was one. Oh, I'll come and see you. I... I won't be able to help myself. Dearest? No, this is Court Lodge, where you're... Here's Mary. We had a splendid time in London, Mary. Uh -huh. I'm so glad you came before us, Mary. We don't feel so strange finding you here to welcome us. I should just a great happiness, I wish you, ma'am, in your lovely new home. 
This is Mrs. Baines, the cook, Mum. And that's Susan, the parlour maid. I'm sure we'll do everything, ma'am, to make you comfortable. Oh, I'm sure you will. I must say goodbye. The carriage is waiting to take me to the castle. I must tell the Earl of your safe arrival. He needn't go tonight. I'd so like to have him with me my first night here. No, I'm sure Lord Dorincourt won't expect his grandson tonight. Tomorrow will be time enough. I dread so to tell him that we're not going to live together anymore. I'm a coward, I know. Putting it off so long, but it's... It's the most difficult and most cruel thing I've ever had to do. I wish you'd tell his lordship, please, that I'd rather not have the money. You mean the income he wishes to settle on you? I have a little money of my own. It's quite enough to live simply on. I must accept the house, of course, because that makes it possible for me to be near Seti. I'm grateful to him for that, but... He'll be very angry. He won't understand it at all. I think he will understand. He must understand that I can't accept money from a man who... hates me so much that he's separating me from my boy. I'll deliver your message. I think it's beautiful here, don't you, dearest? Seti, darling, there's something I must tell you. You're not going to understand it, I know. But I want you to believe me, as you always have, when I tell you it's for the best. Tomorrow, Mr. Havisham will take you to your grandfather, and you will live with him at the castle. But I shall not go with you. This pretty house will be my home, and Mary will be here to look after me. But, dearest, you don't mean... You can't mean that we're not going to be together, just as we've always been. Oh, no, I can't. I couldn't. I won't. I won't. Seti. <laughs> You must be brave and sensible. If there are some things you can't understand now, you'll understand them later. It's best for you to live there. There, there are good reasons why it is. You mean you want me to go away from you? Of course not, darling. But now you're growing older, and we must trust, help one another without asking any questions. No, Seti. Your grandfather loves you, wants you to love him. He's so kind, he, he wants you to be happy and to make other people happy. But, dearest, I can't be happy without you. But you won't be without me all the time. I'm not far from the castle here. And you'll run in and see me every day. And you'll love the castle. And there'll always be something new and interesting to tell me. And I'll have things to tell you. Oh, Seti, we'll have such good times together. We'll be finding things out, both of us. We'll be explorers. Yes, like, like Mr. Stanley and Mr. Livingston. That'll be exciting. And every night, when it grows dark, I'll put a candle in the window to guide you through the jungle, Mr. Stanley.
Ah, Newick, how's his lordship? In a rare mood this evening he is. He told me to evict all the tenants if they weren't paid up. Oh, I dare say that'll be a job to your liking. Oh, sir. Ah, Purvis. Glad to see you again. I'm very glad to see you, sir. Oh, idiot! Don't watch your coat! And bring my water! Gout. Oh, yes, sir. These last few weeks have been the worst I've ever known, sir. I'm surrounded by a lot of incompetent linkables. Shut the door, you blockhead! I can't stand him no longer, Mr. Purvis. He's too much for any man. Cursing and swearing and calling people out the names like he does. And it ain't just today, it's every day. Thomas, you brought him the 63 port. He prefers the 51. Oh, was I to know he didn't say. Fetch the other bottle. Mm, what business you got drinking port anyway? Let's go to the shoe. I can't feed and house every lazy lout in the parish, and I won't. You and your poor. I've had enough of them. But, my lord. Mr. Mordaunt is with him, sir. I said all I had to say, and now I say good night. Oh, good day, my lord. Oh, good day. Right, oh, you I, pocket, how'd sir. you do, Mr. Havisham? Uh, Mr. Mordaunt. Mr. Havisham, my lord. Well, Havisham. Lord. Come back, have you? Put that cushion right for me, will you? I, 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 careful! Uh, uh. Good, well, a uh, hot needle. Well, what have you got to tell me? Lord Fonsoro and his mother are at Court Lodge. They bore the voyage excellent, eh? And in good health. Huh. What else? His lordship remains with his mother tonight. I'll bring him to the castle tomorrow. Oh, go on, go on, tell me everything. What sort of a lad is he? Never mind about the mother. What sort of a lad is he, I say? It's rather difficult to judge the character of a child of nine. A fool, huh? Clumsy cub. I don't know much about children, but I thought him rather a fine lad. Healthy, well-grown, eh? Apparently healthy, quite well-grown. Straight-limbed, well enough to look at. Rather handsome, my lord, as boys go. Ah. Huh. Although I'm, I'm scarcely a judge. I dare say you'll find him a little different from most English children. Oh, no doubt of that. American children are the most impudent and worst brought up in the world. I've heard that often enough. In his case, I would hardly call it impudence. The difference is, I think, that he's lived more with older people than with children. But I should call it a mixture of maturity and childishness. Exactly. Beastly, impudent, bad manners. That's what it is. I, uh... I have a message to deliver from Mrs. Errol. I want none of her messages. The less I hear of her, the better. Ah, but this is rather an important one. She prefers not to accept the income you propose to settle on her. What's that? What do you say? She says it's not necessary. That is, the relations between you are not, uh, not friendly. Not friendly? I should say they were not friendly. Mercenary, sharp-voiced American. Lord, you could hardly call her mercenary. She's asked for nothing. Ah, all done for effect. She thinks she can wheedle me into seeing her. Thinks I shall admire her spirit, but I don't. She shall have the money sent to her whether she likes it or not. She won't spend it. I don't care whether she spends it. She shall have it sent to her. She shan't tell people that she's got to live as a pauper because I'm doing nothing for her. Huh? I suppose she's poisoning the boy's mind against me too. No. I have another message that will prove to you she's not done that. I won't care. Oh. Ah. Oh. She asks you not to let Lord Fontoray hear anything that might lead him to understand that you're separating him from her because of your prejudice against her. She says he wouldn't comprehend it. That it might make him fear you in some measure, or at least cause him to feel less affection for you. She wants there to be no shadow. On your first meeting. Come now, Havisham, come now. You don't mean the mother hasn't told him? Not a word, my lord. Nothing has been said to the boy to give him the slightest doubt of your perfection. She's prepared to believe you the most amiable and affectionate of grandparents. In fact, he already regards you as a wonder of generosity. Ah. He 
does, eh? I would suggest, my lord, that Fauntleroy's impressions of you depend entirely upon yourself. I make a further suggestion that you will succeed better with him if you take care not to speak slightingly to him of his mother. The boy's only nine. Nevertheless, those nine years have been spent at his mother's side. She has all his affection. Hmm. So he thinks me generous, eh? Lordship anywhere, sir. Yes, the captain's face and way. Oh, was it you who sent the cat? I'm ever so much obliged to you, ma'am. How do you do? He's a great lady, this, sir. Where's his lordship? In the library, sir. Lord Fauntleroy is to be sent to him alone. <laughs> yourself about marrying your relations. Eh? I'm not sure that I do. Oh, any boy would love his grandfather, especially one who's been as kind to him as you've been. Oh, so I've been kind to you, have I? Yes. I'm ever so much obliged to you about Bridget and the Apple Woman and Dick. Bridget? Dick? Apple Woman? They were particular friends of mine. You know, they were the ones you gave me all that money for. The money you told Mr. Havensham to give me if I wanted it. Oh, the money you were to spend as you liked, eh? So you spent it all on these people, did you? Bridget, Dick, and the apple woman. Yes, and I gave Mr. Hobbs a gold watch and chain and a pipe. I put some poetry in the watch. It was, when this you see, remember me. I'm going to miss Mr. Hobbs very much. Who is Mr. Hobbs? He was our grocer. 
Fancy vegetables and groceries, you know. He's my closest friend. Mr. Hobbs is a very clever man. Do you know he can recite the Declaration of Independence right through? Oh. What's the matter? I just remembered you might not like to hear about the Declaration of Independence. I forgot you were an Englishman. Huh? I forgot you were English too, didn't you? Oh, no. I'm an American. You are English. Your father was an Englishman. I was born in America. You have to be an American if you're born in America. You oh, don't... I beg your pardon for contradicting you. Mr. Hobbs says that if there's ever to be another war, that I should have to be an American. But I promised him that if there were to be another war, I should try to stop it. You would, would you? <laughs> Dinner is served, my lord. Ah. Now, be careful, man. Be careful. Careful, man, careful! Would you like me to help you? You can lean on me, you know. Once when Mr. Hobbs had his foot with the potato barrel falling on it, he used to lean on me. You think you could do it? I think I could. I'm very strong. I'm nine, you know. You lean on your stick on one side and on me on the other. Well, you must try. Just lean on me. I'll walk very slowly. Don't be afraid of leaning on me. I'm all right, if it isn't a very long way. You see that old fellow in red velvet? He was the 10th Earl of Doric Court. King George I decorated him for services during the war with Spain and Austria. He was tremendously strong. He could bend a bar of iron between his hands. You get your strength from him. How very interesting. Did you ever try putting your foot in hot water and mustard? Mr. Hobbs used to. Arnica is a very good thing too, they tell me. Oh, thank you. I'll try it. getting warm in the summertime. Great heaven! What's that? It's a present from Dick. Isn't it beautiful? When this I see, I... I shall always remember Dick. Yes, I should think you would. It'd be difficult to forget him. Dick's a professional bootblack. You'd like him. He's so square. Square? Yes. He wouldn't cheat anyone or hit a boy under his thighs. Oh. Very pretty as well, eh? Thank you. What's the matter? Don't you like your soup? Oh, yes. I was just wondering. Wondering? Wondering what? You don't wear your coronet all the time, then? No, no. It, uh, it doesn't become me. Mr. Hobbs said you wore it all the time. But after he thought it over, he said he thought you must take it off sometimes to put your hat on. <coughs> yes, I... Uh, I take it off occasionally. Out of your house. I never saw anything so beautiful. But it's a very big house for just two people to live in, isn't it? Oh? Do you think it's too large? Well, I was only thinking that if two people lived in it who are not very good companions, they might get a little lonely sometimes. Thank you. Do you think I shall make a good companion? Yes, I think you will. I think you should be almost as interesting as Mr. Hobbs. Oh. Mr. Hobbs and I were very great friends. He was the best friend I had, except. Wonderoy, what are you thinking of? 
I was thinking of dearest. Who is dearest? She is my mother. I, I think I'd better get up and, and walk up and down. He's a very nice dog. He's my friend. He knows how I feel. How do you feel? Come here. You see, I, I never was away from my own house before. It makes a person feel a strange feeling when he has to stay all night in another person's castle instead of his own house. But, but dearest is not very far away from me. She told me to remember that. And, and after all, I'm nine, you know. And I can look at the picture she gave me. Look, you press the spring and it opens, and there she is. Suppose you think you're very fond of her. Yes, I do think so, and it's true. Mr. Hunt and the others were my friends. The dearest is my close friend. My father left her to me to take care of. When I'm a man, I'm going to work and earn money for her. Oh, what do you think of doing? Well, I did think of going into business with Mr. Hobbs. But I should like to be president. We'll send you to the House of Lords instead. Well, if I couldn't be president, and if that's a good business, I shouldn't mind. The grocery business is dull sometimes. Yes, so's the House of Lords. But it's the business that every Earl of Court goes into. I shall have to talk to Dearest about it. In the library, sir. And such goings on I never heard in all my life. Do you think it'd be all right for me to see him? Oh, yes, sir. He's expecting you. Oh. Ah. 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 Morning, Morning. Morton. Find a new employment, you see. Any good at marbles, Morden? My muscles are a little stiff, my lord, but I'll see what I can do. Oh, pity about that. I'd forgotten about your age. <laughs> oh. This is the new Lord Fondleroy. Fondleroy, this is Mr. Morden, rector of the parish. I'm very glad to make your acquaintance, sir. I'm delighted to make your acquaintance, Lord Fondleroy. Well, what is it this morning? Who's in trouble now? It's one of your tenants, my lord. Higgins of Edge Farm. Newick has told him that if he doesn't pay the rent, he must leave the place. He's a bad tenant. Always behind, Newick tells me. He's devoted to his wife and children. If the farm is taken from him, they may literally starve. That's like Michael. Oh, I forgot we had a philanthropist here. Come here. 
What would you do in this case? Well, if I were very rich, I should let him stay and give him things for his children. Nonsense. You're Lord Fauntleroy. Time you learn to deal with these situations. You can write, can't you? Uh, yes, but not very well. Well, go over to the desk and write Newick his orders. Now, what must I say? You must say... Higgins is not to be interfered with for the present. And sign it, Fauntleroy. Do you think it will do? Yes. Higgins will find it entirely satisfactory. Mr. Hobbs always signed his letters that way, and I thought I'd better say please. Is that exactly the right way to spell interfered? Well, it's not exactly the way it's spelled in the dictionary, but... I was afraid of that. No, yes, the Higgins won't complain of the spelling. I think you must be the best person in the whole world. Don't you, Mr. Mordrant? <laughs> I shall write and tell Mr. Hobbs. Oh, uh, and what'll you tell him? I shall tell him I think you're the kindest man I ever heard of. And that you're always thinking of other people and making them happy. And that I hope when I grow up, I shall be just like you. Just like me. There you are, Morton. Take that with you. I will indeed. This is good news. Thank you, my lord. Oh, don't thank me. Thank Fauntleroy. Thank you. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. May I go to see Dearest now? I think she'll be waiting for me. There's something for you to see in the stables first. Ring the bell. In the stables? If you please, I'm very much obliged, but I think I'd better see it tomorrow. She'll be expecting me all the time. Oh, very well. We'll order the carriage. And you don't care to see what's in the stables? Oh, I do, I do. Doesn't matter. It's only a pony. Pony? Whose pony is it? Yours. Mine? Yes. Oh, I never thought I'd have a pony. I never thought that. How glad dearest will be. You give me everything, don't you? Wouldn't you like to see it? Of course I want to see it. I want to see it so much I can hardly wait. But I'm afraid there isn't time. You must see your mother this afternoon. You can't put it off till tomorrow? Why, she's been thinking about me all the morning. And I've been thinking about her. Oh, perhaps, have you? I'll, I'll ring the bell. I'm not going to get out. Not... not to see Dearest? Dearest will excuse me. Go and tell her that not even your new pony will keep you away. She'll be disappointed. She'll want to see you very much. I'm afraid not. The carriage will call for you as we come back. Drive on, Jeffries. It's a shame, parted from his own mother. Cook at Court Lodge was telling Sarah she'd never have worked for a sweeter lady than Mrs. Errol. 
The letter was written by the little gentleman, his own self, signed with his name to Fauntleroy, as large as life. <laughs> the little precious. Aye, that's the mother. A pretty young thing, too. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. It's his lordship coming to services. That's a new notion. They say even his gout's improving. Look at the young lord. He's Captain Cedric all over again. He's the captain soft of a life. How glad the people are to see you. Take off your hat, Father Roy. They're bowing to you. To me? God bless your lordship. Long life to you. Thank you. I suppose he's come to have a look at his new landlord. Yes, my lord. I understand his young lordship was kind enough to speak for me, and I thought I'd like to say a word of thanks. I've got a great deal to thank your lordship for. Oh, I only wrote the letter. It was my grandfather who did it. You know how good he always is to people. Is Mrs. Higgins well now? Uh, yes, your lordship. <laughs> the missus is better since the trouble was took off her mind. My grandfather was very sorry about your children having the scarlet fever. You see, Higgins, you people have all been mistaken about me. Lord Fontroy understands me. If you want a little reliable information on the subject of my character, apply to him. Get in the garage, Fontroy. very much? Yes, sir. I miss her all the time. You don't miss her, do you? I don't know her. I know. And that's what makes me wonder. She told me not to ask any questions, and I won't. But 
You see her almost every day, don't you? Isn't that enough? We used to see each other all the time. And we could tell each other things without waiting. Well, don't you ever forget about her? No, sir, never. I shouldn't forget about you, you know. If I didn't live with you, I should think about you. All the more. On my word, I believe you would. such a good Earl, he reminds me of you. He is a universal favorite. Well, reminds me of you. Think of that now. He's known this Earl only a little while, and we, we was lifetime acquaintances. I don't know as I want him to be reminded of me by this Earl. They've been using influence on him, I bet you. You're right. They got twisty ways, those aristocrats. They'd wheedle their little finger around your heart as soon as look at you. All for their own purposes, mind. It's a pity they're making an oil out of him. Yeah. He would have been a shining light in the grocery business. A shining light. Do you know any particulars about that stuff, like castles and oils? No, not much. Except they're haughty and mean. Sure is a Jim Dandy letter he wrote. Almost as good as seeing him. Only it ain't, of course. Oh, he was a plum daisy of a kid. I bet you sometimes he wishes he was back here. I do. You lonely? Oh, not so bad. Where you living now? Oh, me and two other fellas, we got a room in a lodging house. The other two fellas, they get drunk and fighting, but it's cheap. Oh, that's no sort of a place for a lad like you to be living. Now, look here. I got a clean, dry loft over my stable, and there's an old bed you can have. Why don't you come here and stay? Won't cost you a cent. Gee, do you mean that, Mr. Hobbs? Well, certainly I do. Yahoo! Gee, Mr. Hobbs talking about oils. You ain't no oil, you're a prince. Oh, sure. I wonder whether he will have an American accent. My dear, won't it be interesting if he has the darn cold eyebrows? <laughs> when do we see the mother? Shh! I believe she's supposed to be kept in the background. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marinux, is this the boy? Yes, Constantia, this is the boy. Fontaroy, this is your great aunt, Lady Lauridale. How do you do, great aunt? How do you do, young man? You're like your father. I loved him more than most people in this wicked world. Oh, did you know my father? Know him? Of course I did. Oh, then you must be dearest. She will enormously like to talk to you about him. You see, I was the only one she could talk about him to who knew him. And I was so small when he... Yes, uh, Fondleroy, this is your great uncle, Sir Harry Lauridale. How do you do, sir? Here are your fond of horses. I confess to you, Constantia, that uh, what you'll probably see for yourself. There's a risk of my becoming rather an old fool about him. Becoming? <laughs> By the way, the mother. What does she think of you? I don't know. I haven't asked her. You must come over to Lauderdale Park one day and see us. There are some uh, new cocker puppies in the kennels. You shall have your pick. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Uncle. Only Dougal might be offended. You see, he's very fond of me, and I really shouldn't like to hurt his feelings. <laughs> Hurt his feelings. That's a good one. Did you hear that come there? Hurt his feelings. <laughs> this is Miss Herbert, Fauntleroy. I want you to be great friends with her. How do you do? Have you met Dougal? He shakes hands beautifully. Shake hands with Miss Herbert, Dougal. <laughs> He's a great friend of mine. I like making friends, don't you? Yes, I do. May I be your friend? And Dougal. Oh, yes, if you please. Okay, Lambego, Bonnish Better, I hope. Thanks. 
much better. I've known Dorian Court as well as anyone could know him for five and thirty years. And that's the first time he's ever bothered to inquire about my health. Most extraordinary. <laughs> oh, have you me a late? What's kept you? I beg your pardon, my lord. I, I was detained by extraordinary news. You? What? What news? Not now, if you don't mind. Later, my lord, later. <laughs> The young May moon is beaming, love. The glowworm's lamp is gleaming, love. How sweet to roam through a mourner's grove while the drowsy world is dreaming, love. Then awake till rise of sun, my dear. The sage's glass will shun, my dear. Or in watching the flight of bodies of life, he might happen to take thee for one, my dear. Charming, charming. What a sweet song. Delightful, my dear. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Do you like music? Yes, I like it when you sing it. Oh. <laughs> Dear me, Lord Fauntleroy, why do you look at me so? I was thinking how beautiful you are. <laughs> oh, Fauntleroy, make the most of your time. When you're older, you'll not have the courage to say that. Nobody could help saying it. Don't you think she's pretty, too? No. We are not allowed to say what we think. Lord Fauntleroy shall say what he thinks. I'm sure he thinks what he says. I think you're prettier than anyone I ever saw, except dearest. I think she is the prettiest person in the world. I'm sure she is. And I must tell her how kind you've been to me. I never was at a party before, and I've enjoyed myself so much. Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, little Lord Fauntleroy. Keep well. Havisham, what in the world's the matter? Something serious must have happened to make you behave like this. What is it? It's bad news. The very worst of news, my lord. I'm sorry I have to be the bearer of it. Why do you look at the boy so? You hang over him like a bird of below man. Has it anything to do with Fodleroy? My lord, I waste no words. My news has everything to do with him. If we're to believe it, it's not Lord Fauntleroy who lies asleep before us, but only the son of Captain Errol. The present Lord Fauntleroy is the son of your boy Bevis, and at this moment is in a lodging house in London. What do you mean? You're mad! It's a lie! An abominable lie! If it's a lie, it's painfully like the truth. A woman came to my chambers this morning and told me that she married your son, Bevis, in London 11 years ago. She showed me the marriage certificate. The child was born shortly after Bevis deserted her and was taken by her to America. Oh, the woman's obviously an imposter. It's a trumped-up fraud. I'm afraid not, my lord. I saw the boy's birth certificate. She's, I'm afraid, a very ignorant person. But she's consulted a lawyer who advises her that her son is, of course, Lord Fauntleroy and the rightful heir. She demands that his claim be immediately acknowledged. I'll protest this to the last. I'll disown Bevis's boy. I'll have nothing to do with him or his mother. You can't disown him, my lord. Nothing we can do can keep the eldest son's child from his inheritance. The woman you say is an ignorant, vulgar person, eh? She can hardly spell her own name. She's obviously uneducated and openly mercenary. And I... I objected to his mother. I suppose it's retribution. If anyone had ever told me I could be fond of a child, I 
wouldn't have believed them. I always detested children. I own more than most. But I'm fond of him. And oddly enough, he's fond of me. You know, Havisham, I'm not popular. I never was. But he's fond of me. Never was afraid of me. All of his trust in me. Yes, Havisham. He'd have filled my place better than I've filled it. He'd have been an honor to the name. I suppose you may say it's a judgment on Molyneux. But that boy, the first human being he ever loved. Will Molyneux take the case to the courts, do you think? Can't tell. He's obstinate enough. Mm, the courts of the devil. You go in with your best suit, buckles on your shoes, and come out as nature made you. Bless my soul, Constantia. Whoever would have dreamed that I'd have felt sorry for the old boy. I wouldn't have minded our having a boy like that, Harry. Yes. Better luck for us, old girl, if we had. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing. If his little lordship loses his title, the village loses the best friend it has. Mm. Aye, that's right. And I'll tell you another thing. It'll drive the Earl mad if this goes wrong for him. Why, he's been so proud of the boy, you'd hardly believe it if you knew him for what he was before. Mm. And the new one's no lady, that's sure. Bold-faced thing, that's what she is. <laughs> the dark-eyed, brazen-faced wench. Yes, I'll come in now with Mr. Aversham. You've someone here calling herself Lady Fontaroy. I want to see her. Ah, come the ways, my lord. This way, my lord. Turl of Daring Court. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure, my lord. Bevins? Go shake hands with your grandpa. So that's the way you're going to treat your grandson, is it? Ah, oh, you needn't try to look so fierce about it. He's your grandson, all right. Uh, yes, my lord. We have proof of the young gentleman's birth. He is the son of the late Lord Fauntleroy. Allow me to introduce myself. Joshua Snade, at your service. My car. Uh, I've already had the pleasure of making Mr. Havisham's acquaintance. Uh, Lady Fauntleroy has placed all the evidence in my hands. I can assure you, my lord, it is sufficient to justify her case should it come into court. Uh, but may I suggest that uh, we uh, come to an arrangement and settle this matter amicably on a friendly basis? Friendly? Ha! Look at him staring at me as though I was dirt. Me, his own daughter-in-law. Oh, your son Bevis married me, all right. And a fine rotter he was. But he was the father of my boy, and I can prove it. Lady Fontenoy, please. You may think you can fight me, but a lot of good it'll do you. They don't love you around here, and you know it. I've heard plenty about you and your dirty, snobbish pride. Plenty of pride you'll have when I'm finished with you. Unless you want to climb down off your high horse and get reasonable with your own flesh and blood. Lady Fauntleroy, You shut you. up. I'll stop at nothing, do you hear? I'll drag this case through every court in the land. I'll let the whole world know what you are. You and your precious son, Bevis, deserting me and his own child, a babe in arms. How I've suffered, heaven only knows. And you standing there looking at me and my boy as if we were scum. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You 
say you married my eldest son. If that's proved to be true, the law's on your side. In that case, your son will be Lord Futteroy, and you will be provided for. But I warn you, the matter will be sifted to the very bottom. I'll only add that I want to see nothing of you or your boy as long as I live. After my death, you can, unfortunately, do as you please. Yes, you're exactly the kind of person that I should have expected my son, Bevis, to choose. <laughs> I'm afraid, Dorian Court, there can be no two opinions. At least that's how I see it. You agree, Semple? Yes, I'm afraid we can see it in no other way. But it's... it's monstrous! That woman, and that boy, are utterly unfit. Alas, the law can take no cognizance of such things. I sympathize, Dorin Court, more than I can say. Sympathize? What's the use of that? <clears throat> if we take it to the courts, you think there can be only one result? I'm afraid so. The birth certificate, everything we have, point the same way. If you take it to court, you'll have the expense and the notoriety and only, I fear, one possible result. Perhaps the boy won't turn out so badly as you fear. Perhaps you can do something with him. That boy? That oaf? With the other one? Yes. Uh, uh, I have no other course but to accept your judgment. Come, have it. Thank you, my lord. And you, Mr. Simple. It's you, ma'am. The Earl itself. Show him in. Mrs. Arrow. I am Lord Dorincourt. The boy is very like you. People have often said so. I'm glad to think he's like his father, too. Yes, he is. Like my son. Won't you sit down? I've come to tell you that I've had the very best, the highest legal opinion. I'm sorry. This outrageous woman and her child... Perhaps she cares for him as much as I care for Seddy, my lord. Her son is Lord Fauntleroy. Mine is not. Yes, I'm afraid you're right. Perhaps you would prefer that Seddy should not be the Earl of Darling Court. It's a very magnificent thing to be the Earl of Dorincourt, my lord. I know that. But all I care about is that Seddy should be what his father was. Brave, just and kind, always. Hmm. A striking contrast to what his grandfather is, eh? I haven't had the pleasure of knowing his grandfather. I know my little boy believes you. I know that Seddy loves you. Would he have loved me if you told him why I didn't receive you at the castle? No. Honestly, I think not. That's why I didn't wish him to know. Well, there are very few women who wouldn't have told him. Yes. Said he is fond of me. And I'm fond of him. I can't say that I was ever fond of anyone before. But he pleased me from the first. I'm an old man, and I was tired of my life. But he's given me something to live for. More than that. More than that. I'm proud of him. I was satisfied to think that one day he'd be taking my place as head of the family. I'm 
miserable. Miserable. Please sit down. You've been so much troubled, you must be tired. And you need all your strength. Thank you. Perhaps it's because I'm miserable that I've come to you. I used to hate you. I've been jealous of you. This wretched, disgraceful business has changed all that. After seeing this repulsive woman who... Well, I felt it would be a relief to come to you. I'm an obstinate old fool, I suppose. I know I've treated you badly. But I've come to you because the boy cares for you. And because I care for you. Treat me as well as you can. For the boy's sake. Whatever happens, he shall be provided for. Sadie shall be taken care of now and in the future. Always. Thank you. You like the house? Oh, very much. It's a cheerful room. May I come back again and talk this matter over? As often as you wish. boy now, won't he? Like I was? No! He'll have to live in the castle if he's Lord Fauntleroy, won't he? That common little brat shall never enter this place in my lifetime. I'll take care of that. Then I can still be your boy, even if I'm not going to be the Earl, just like I was before? My boy. Yes, you'll be my boy as long as I live. And by Jove, Sometimes I think you're the only boy I've ever had. Then I don't care about the Earl part at all. I thought, you see, that the one that was going to be the Earl had to be your boy. And that I couldn't be. I shall never take anything from you that I can hold for you. Come what may, you shall have all that I can give. All. And dearest? be taken away from her? No. They can take nothing from her. Nothing from either of you. Come, 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 come. Time you were asleep. Bridget Earl remains secluded in his castle and refuses to have any communication with the rightful heir. Ah, oh, we know that stuff. They've been printing that for the past weeks. Is there anything new about SETI? Yes, here it says, uh, the 
prospects do not look very bright for the false claimant, Cedric Errol of Brooklyn. Well, I'm jiggered. At last, they succeeded in robbing him out of being an earl. I thought you was against oils. So I am. Ain't it just like him? Cheating the poor kid out of his rightful estates. Now, what's going to become of it? I know one thing. He's done everything in a well for me, and he can always come back here and have half of my shoe shining business. Well, now, I'll tell you, Dick. I'd always had it in my mind that said he would come in with me someday. He'd be a shining light in the grocer business. The new lady Fauntleroy was formerly an actress. She is said to have played in New York and London. Continued on page five. Here's a picture of her. Holy mackerel. What's the matter? Here, look at this. It's her. Her? She ain't no aristocrat, she ain't. I know her as good as I know you. It's Minna, Ben's wife. Your brother? Sure. You mean it's some kind of hocus-pocus? Sure I do. Well, I'm jiggered. She was married before, but I never heard of her having no other kid but Ben's kid. You mean the one Ben went out to Chicago to look for? Sure. Maybe she had another kid in England. Eh, uh, maybe she didn't, maybe she didn't. We ought to do something about this. You're dead right, we ought to. But we got to get the proper advice. She, I wished I knew Alderman Murphy. I know Alderman Murphy. You do? Yeah, come along, let's go right now. Them Earls, they've always had a spite against us Americans ever since the Revolution. What a place. What a hole. I'm sick to death of it. Cooped up here, week in and week out with nobody to talk to. You're complimentary. I wasn't meaning to be. And grateful. You're getting your money, aren't you? Business is business, you know. Business. I'm sick of business. I want some fun. Why don't you go up to London for a while? London? <laughs> Not on your tin type. Nothing would please that old devil up at the castle better than to see me clear out. Well, I'll stay here, here in this rotten country pub. But you've lived in worse places in your time, I've no doubt. That's none of your business. You keep a civil tongue in your head or I'll hand you your walking papers. I wouldn't. What do you mean? Just what I said. I wouldn't try anything like that, Minna. I'm Lady Fauntleroy to you. Uh, uh. Come in. Why, it's Lord Darncourt. Why, this is a pleasure, a real pleasure, I'm sure. Won't you take it? To hello, Minna. Why, hello, Dick. Why, Ben, what are you doing here? Where have you been all this time? Do you know her? Funny if he didn't, seeing as how he was my second husband. Where is the child? What child? You know what child, our boy Tom. Oh, Ben, but you know, you must have heard. Someone must have told you. Told me what? It was pneumonia. Only three days and he was gone. It broke my heart. I meant to write you, but I didn't know where you were. If that's true, who is this boy you've got with you? That's none of your business, Ben Tipton. Can I see him? No, you can't. Tell us, please, why Mr. Tipton should not see your boy. Oh, hello, Uncle Dick. Well, I'll be jiggered. Oh, 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 you shut up! You're a dirty pair, you are, coming all this way to spy on me, trying to do me hurt. I'll have the law on you for the way you're hounding me. You. Ooh. Come here, Tom. I knew nothing of this, my lord, I assure you. There's a little matter of a forged birth certificate. But I swear to you... Oh, never mind, Havisham. I've had enough of this. Too much. The sooner the pair of you are out of this country, the better. Come on, Havisham. You'll be sorry for this, you will. It's prosecution, that's what it is. It's robbery.
this will be somewhat in the manner of a museum, my lord? Well, not exactly a museum, Mr. Hobbs. They're portraits of my ancestors. Your ancestors? All of them? Well, I'll be jiggered. Your great uncle, he must have had a family. Did he raise them all? I mean that they were earlier distinguished members of the family. Do you know, Earl, I used to have a very poor opinion of you aristocracy. But I've changed. I'll take you, for instance. You're a pretty good sort, even if you are an Earl. I'm very gratified. A bit gay, wasn't he? Yes. That's why I have the gout, Mr. Hobbs. Oh. And they was all earls. And said he's going to be one. And own all this. And he'll be worthy of it, Mr. Hobbs. Sure he will. All these earls. You know, I wouldn't have minded being one myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's such a lovely day. I always like having birthdays, but never one so much as this because you're all so kind to me. Uh, my grandfather wants everybody to be happy and comfortable, and I'll want it too when I'm grown up. I think that's all because I'm not very good at making speeches, but I must say that I'm very much obliged to you for liking my birthday. Ripping little nipper. Ain't he a daisy? I'll bet you boys elect him king someday. <coughs> I didn't know the little fella could talk so good. Why, he makes a better speech than Alderman Murphy. By Joe. Oh, well, I'll be jiggered. And I've another birthday present for you. Another one besides all the things this morning? Yes, the best of them all. Oh, dearest! Oh, dearest! Oh, dearest, I was wanting you here. I was wanting you here so terribly much. Were you, darling? Ponderoy, your mother's come to live with us in the castle. To live with us? To live with us for always? Are you sure you really want me? We've always wanted you, but we weren't exactly aware of it. Well, Mr. Hobbs, it's so nice having you here with us. I dread to think of you ever going back to America. Not to live there. Not to live there. America's a good enough country for them that's young and stern. But there's faults in it. There's not an aunt's sister among them. Nor an earl. 